you got your Bible, hold it up and let's say it together. This is my Bible. I am what it says that I am. I can do what it says that I can do. I can have what it says I can have. Today, I will be taught the uncompromised Word of God. My mind is alert and my heart is receptive. I'll not leave the same as I came in Jesus' name. And every time I come to Church on the Rock, my faith and my life get stronger and stronger. Give the Lord a good shout. And you are shouting really good today. Amen. All right, let's open our manual. Let's open our textbook. Let's open the Bible to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, and the series we're on this month is the Law of Contentment. We've given you a take-home tool with the gratitude journals. If, if you haven't got one, they're free. We're not passing them out because if you don't want one, we don't want to waste it, right? We want to be good stewards. But if you'd like one or you have a friend that you know would be blessed by one, they're free. They're on the sides in the back on your way out. You can get them today. So the Law of Contentment. You know, contentment is so, so important, isn't it? Contentment, you know, the world has the wrong definition of contentment. And I think many in the church have the wrong definition of contentment. So we've given you the definition of contentment, and we've told you the benefits of it. Today, I want to give you four practical ways that we build contentment in our life. You know, my definition of contentment is this. It's simple. It's to enjoy your journey. Enjoy your life. You know, your life is a gift from God, right? And every day that God gives to us is a gift from Him. And you and I want to maximize and not waste every day of our life. So it's God's will that we enjoy the journey while we're pursuing God's purpose for our life. Do you see the balance there? Because some people think that contentment is complacency, and it is not. Some people think that contentment is, okay, be satisfied with what you have, and don't dream, don't have ambition, don't have aspiration. Get rid of all of that, and just, just be satisfied and content where you're at. Well, that's half true, but not the whole truth. Because God wants us to be happy where we're at. And contentment is not getting your happiness from your surroundings. Contentment is getting your happiness from God. Right? It's an inward thing. It's an inward job. It's an inside job. Hallelujah. So contentment is enjoying the journey while you have godly ambition, aspirations, you're dreaming, you're believing that the rest of your life will be the best of your life. You're believing that tomorrow is going to be better than today. You're believing that every day you're getting better, better every day in every way, just 1%. You're believing that God has a future for you, and because of that, you have power in the present. You're enjoying the journey while you're pursuing God's big dream for your life. Amen. Contentment gets rid of frustration. Contentment actually will get rid of fatigue. Contentment. You know, I remember, here's the holidays. I remember when our kids were small, they were little guys, and you know, we're from Iowa originally, and it's about six hours from here to where our parents lived. And I remember going there home, you know, at Thanksgiving or Christmas. And when, the, when our kids were little, we'd get in the car. It's a six-hour drive. We'd just get outside Winsville. And they would say this, are we? Oh, you dealt with the same thing. Are we there yet? No, we just began the journey. We've just begun. And then we'd get to, you know, we, we would get to uh, Columbia. And boy, they were... They were, they were bored. They were frustrated. The journey seemed so long. And again, what would they say? Are we? You know, I think a lot of us, even as we grow up as an adults, you know what? Sometimes it seems like it takes longer than we think, longer than we want it, 
you know, all the, all the above. And I think it's so important for you and I to get from where we're at to where God wants us to be. We have to learn to enjoy where we're at. You know, I remember as well years ago. Now, you know, I'm called to be a pastor teacher. And, and when God sent me here 35 years ago, he sent me here to, to, to feed, lead, and love people to build a work that's you that would impact our city and around the world, right? So that's my occupation. That's my call. That's my gifting. And I want to be the best. And today I'm bringing you my best. And I want to give God my very best, okay? So I know you're praying for me. So I remember, though, back in the, in the mid-80s, mid-80s, our ministry was a, a couple of hundred people. And, and, you know, because I've got a big dream to reach a lot of people for Christ and help a lot of people and make a difference in our nation and the nations, you know, I can remember one of my mentors. Now, we all need mentors, right? We all need mentors. We all need coaches. We all need people like that in our life because they help you accelerate your growth. They, they help you get where God wants you to be faster than you could all by yourself. So I can remember mid-80s, I'm over here uh, after a service setting with one of my mentors, a guest speaker, and he was one of my mentors. In fact, he was on our advisory board. Uh, I'm accountable to him. Uh, and I can remember sitting there with him in the Holiday Inn, which is no longer there, by the way. Old things pass away and all things become new. And, and we're sitting there and, you know, I'm kind of grumbling and complaining. I know you've never done that, but I'm just saying, you know, why is it taking so long? And man, I'm doing blah, 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 blah. And, you know, he looks at me and he says this to me, Dave, if you're not happy where you're at, you'll never be happy where you think you're going. Amen. I never forgot that. I never forgot that. That went deep into my spirit, that went deep into my heart, and it's helped me all these years. Because a lot of people think, oh, when I get the bigger house, I'll be happy. And you got the bigger house and the relatives wanted to move in with you. Oh, you know, if I just get a new car or a new truck, then I'll be happy. And you got the new car, you got the new truck, and, and your brother-in-law came and saw it and pointed out all the scratches on the fender. <laughs> oh, you know, if I, if I could just make this amount of money, if I could just get a raise and get an increase, get a better job, and, and you got the better job, and you got the increase, and you got the bonus, but you found out Brother Sandpaper works there. <laughs> Difficult people. You know, if we're not happy where we're at, we won't be happy where we think we're going. Right? So contentment is the power. It's an inward power. Contentment is not an outward trapping, even though it will manifest on the outside. But it's an inside job. Contentment comes from within through not resources. It doesn't come through possessions or materialism. You, you know, the most important thing in life is not things. The most important thing in life is not things. It's a relationship with God. And so it's not resources. It's not materialism. It's not things that give us real happiness and peace and joy and contentment. It comes through a relationship with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen, church. So that, that's the gist of it, is that if we'll learn to be content, and by the way, you got to learn to be content. And just when you think you've arrived, you find out you haven't arrived, right? So let's look at the scripture. The Apostle Paul, he's in prison. He's, he's in St. Charles County Jail. Uh, the Apostle Paul's in prison. Bad set of circumstances. You know, you might be in a bad set of circumstances today, but in the midst of that, through a relationship with God, you can be content. What does that mean? That you can have the joy and the peace and the confidence and the direction in your life that you're craving, and you won't get it from your trappings or your circumstances or prestige or possessions or promotion, but you'll get it through a relationship. Amen. Contentment is a, is a strength. It's an inward strength that you're not moved by your circumstances. We're not ignoring them. We've got giants. All of us have got giants, right? But you're a giant killer. <clears throat> We've all got giants, but you're a giant killer today. Amen. 
We don't run from our problems. We don't run from adversity. We are not quitters. We don't run from trouble. We, we, we don't give up under trouble. We've learned how to be content, which is an inward strength, comes from a relationship with God that gives you power to walk by faith and not by sight. It gives you power to refuse. We could be easy, but we refuse to do what the masses do. We, we refuse to fear, fret, and worry over bad news. We're going to stay fixed and stable and strong and soaring, not sinking, flying, not falling, climbing, not crawling, up in a down world because of our relationship with the Lord. Are you with me, family? So let's look at our text. The Apostle Paul said, not that I speak in respect of what I want, for I have learned. There it is. I have learned. I never forgot what my mentor told me years ago in the 80s. Dave, if you can't be happy where you're at, you'll never be happy where you think you'll be happy. Won't happen. You, you got to learn to make lemonade out of your lemons you got to learn to make milkshake out of your milk. you got to learn to water the grass on this side of the fence. Amen. you got to learn to bloom where you're... Yeah, and life gets better. So he said, I have learned. So we're not born with it. We're not born with it. It doesn't come easy. It's not instant, and it's not automatic. But we need it. We need it to have the peace of God, the joy of God, the confidence of God, clarity of direction. We need it to overcome and be overcomers. And, and we need it to build a platform, have a testimony, uh, have, have a story that will inspire and help and impact other people. Contentment. So contentment, he said, I've learned in whatever state I am, therein to be what? Content. Well, what is it? Now, I've taught you this, that Scripture interprets Scripture. Somebody comes to you with a new doctrine, you want to check it out in the Word of God, and you want more than one Scripture. The Bible says in the mouth of two or three Scriptures, witnesses, every word is established. And how you interpret Scripture and study Scripture is through Scripture. So you look at the verses before and after when you're trying to interpret one Scripture. So he said, I've learned to be content. Well, what's that look like? Verse 12, I, I know how to be abased. I know how to get through when things are tight and I'm going through difficulty and it's really hard. It's really a struggle, but also I know how to abound. I, I, I know how to still come to church and seek God and, and, and go after God when everything, all the bills are paid, the kids are doing well, the marriage is fine, the dating process is fine, my career is on track, I still know how to stay close to God. Right? You know, one of my mentors who's in heaven, John Osteen, you know, he had a, a, a sermon that was entitled, How to Handle Success. How to Handle Success. And one time, he told me, Dave, it's harder to handle success than it is failure. Because usually when we're failing or hurting, we'll just run to God. But when we're succeeding and everything is great, we don't have time for God. So he told me, my mentor, John Osteen, now in heaven, he said it, it's always harder, more difficult, greater test when you're abounding than when you're abasing when you're the, the highs over the lows. So he said, this is contentment. I, I've learned how to get through when things are tough, and I've learned how to stay close to God when everything is great. Everywhere, everywhere, at work, at home, at school, everywhere uh, during the holidays. And, and you know, now during the holidays, years ago, it used to be you'd visit maybe one home or two homes. But now because of our culture and, and the way things are with his and hers and blended and broken families, the average family right now goes to three or four different homes during the holidays. Can you imagine the, the, the tension, the conflict, the hurt, the pain, the memories, uh, all that's going on? That's why it's real important that we stay close to God during the holidays because he'll see you through and he'll see you through victoriously. 
Amen. So he said, I, I, I know how to be full. I know how to be hungry. I know how to abound. I know how to suffer need. Okay, Paul, you told us, you told us that contentment is a learning process. And then you told us in verse 12 what it looks like. But, but Paul, you haven't told us the secret. Paul, you haven't given us the secret sauce. You haven't told us the secret. What's the key to contentment? Verse 13. It's in the same context. It's in the same context. Now, verse 13, let's look at it. This is a scripture that you should be using for your own self-talk. Another mentor in my life, a pastor that was a mentor in my life who's now in heaven, I'll never forget the advice he gave me. Dave, 10 times in the morning, 10 times in the evening, you need to quote this verse. He said, Dave, 10 times in the morning, 10 times in the evening, you need to self-talk this verse. Your self-talk creates your self-image, and you live out of your self-image, your identity, who you think you are. So notice he said, here's how you do it. Here's how I can do all these things. What things? Go through tough times, go through easy times. Here's how I can do it. How can you do it, Paul? What's the secret to contentment? Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. There it is, right, church? It, it, it is the key is not resources. It's not going to make you more happy. You think it will, but when you get there, it's not there. But what's going to make you more content, more happy, more peaceful, enjoying your journey, not missing opportunities because I'm in the mully grubs, not missing opportunities because I happened to be down that day and I missed that opportunity. I didn't see it because I was depressed and stayed depressed all day. So, so what do I do? He, he said, it's through a relationship. It's through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Uh, let's look at another scripture. Let's build 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 6. I have, I have three translations here, a uh, paraphrase, but I want to point out these words. Look what it says. True godliness with what? Brings what? Everybody say great wealth. Now, don't forget that now. So contentment with godliness, a relationship with God, it comes out of that, what we're talking about today. So pastor is for you having great wealth. Because if I will get my contentment out of godliness, out of a relationship with Jesus, not another thing, not another person, not a different place, not a different church, not a different job. And God's all for that if it's his will. But that cannot be my source for contentment. That cannot be the key to enjoy every Monday of my life while I'm pursuing the Fridays of my life. Amen. So uh, look what he says. Godliness with contentment will bring great wealth. Everyone say great wealth. Okay, now let's look at it in another translation. Uh, yes, indeed, a source of profit. Notice that profit. So now pastor's talking to me about having great wealth and profit in my life. Profit for godliness accompanied with contentment that's contentment, which is a sense of inward sufficiency, is great, abundant gain. I want to extract the words here for you of profit and abundance and gain. Look what will contentment all this month that I'm teaching and we're giving you tools with a gratitude journal and the Thanksgiving kit to help your life explode with what? Great wealth, gain, abundance, profit. Oh, I like that. Don't you like that? Let's look at another translation, same verse. But godliness with contentment is great gain. I like the word gain, abundance, profit, great wealth. All that comes from not things. It comes from contentment that comes out of godliness, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Ooh, can we have a praise break? Can we give the Lord a thank you for what he's doing in our life here today? I'm thankful. All right, so look with me, if you would, or you can look on the overhead, 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, I want to give you four takeaways, four principles on how to build contentment in our life. We've defined it, and then we found out what it will do, what it will bring into our life, great wealth, great gain, abundant increase and profit. It'll do all that. But now, Pastor, I just want to know, how am I going to build it in my life? 
Pastor, you know, my family's kind of negative and critical and cynical. I grew up that way. How can I break loose? How, how can I break the curse? How can I change the way I look at things? How, how, can, I, how can I change the outcome by changing my outlook? How, how do I grow and learn to develop contentment? I'm glad you all asked those questions. So number one is this. Stop comparing yourself with other people. All these start with the letter C so we can retain them better. Stop comparing ourselves with other people. Content, uh, uh, contentment, greatest enemy is comparing. Comparing. So let me give you some scriptures. Uh, here's what it says. We dare not make ourselves of the number or the people who what? Compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves, what? Comparing themselves with other people, it says it is what? Not wise. One translation says it is stupid. So it's stupid. Now, cross culture, because all the marketing, all the media, Cyber Monday, Black Friday, all the billboards, uh, everything that we see in our culture is marketing to make us compare ourselves with other people. And we think if we have what they have, we'll be happy. If we look like they look, if we wear what they wear, if we drive what they drive, if we take the vacation they take, then we'll be happy. The, our culture breeds discontentment on purpose. It's all about the buck. It's all about money. All right? So notice, but the Bible says cross-culture in the kingdom of God, we are not to compare ourselves with other people. And under number one, that's number one, stop comparing ourselves with other people. Under that letter A, why is it so important, Pastor, to stop comparing myself with other people? Because letter A, it will rob you of your own uniqueness and your God-given identity. God only made one of you, and the world doesn't need two of us. Henry Ford said, imitation is suicide. Robert Madu, when I asked him a couple weeks ago, what is the greatest need in young people? You travel all over the world preaching to young people. What is the greatest need in teenagers? And he said they lost their identity. They don't know who they are. Well, that's the same thing that when I was a youth pastor, I was dealing with, with young people. I think we all deal with it, right? And when we compare ourselves to other people, letter A, it robs us of our uniqueness. And it's your uniqueness that sets you apart. It's your uniqueness that will put you head and shoulders above the masses. The Bible says, the book of Romans chapter 9, who are we to say who made us? Why did you make me this way? Letter B, under stop comparing ourselves with other people, uh, uh, that will destroy contentment that will destroy and rob us from enjoying every day while we're in hot pursuit of God's purpose for our life, it is letter B it is that it will break your focus and focus is everything. It will break your focus from your purpose because your eyes are on other people. It, it, it will stop your rhythm. It will stop your gait. It will stop uh, your speed. It will slow you down. It will distract you. And because your eyes are off your purpose and your eyes are on people. So when you and I are comparing ourselves to other people, the Bible says that is not wise. One paraphrase says it is literally stupid. Because it robs us of our uniqueness and our identity. And God made you the way that you are because the world needs you to be the best version of who you are, not someone else. And then letter B is it robs you of your uniqueness. And letter C, that when you and I are comparing ourselves to other people, it will rob you of your joy. It will rob you of your joy. Let me give you another scripture. Galatians chapter 6 and verse 4, a living Bible. Can we all read this on the count of three? And those of you online, read it right to where you're at. Here we go. One, two, three. Whoa, 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 whoa. 
Pastor, you wanted us to read it, but that's so good. We've got to stop right there. Let everyone, he's talking to the church at Galatia, or he's talking to the church at Church on the Rock in St. Louis. And what does he say? Let everyone do your very best. So, you know, you and I, we want to give God our best praise, give God our best devotion, give God our best commitment, give God our best dedication, give God the best, the tithe and the offering, our time, talent, and treasure. Can I have an amen? We are called to be our best, be the best usher you can be today, the best youth worker, the best nursery worker, the best children's worker, the best dream teamer. I'm bringing you my very best in this second service today because we owe it to God and we owe it to each other that every day we work on being the best version of who God created us to be. Every day we should have an attitude of improvement, of getting better, of bringing our best and delivering our best and showing up with our best because that's what God asks. Boy, at Church on the Rock, they have a high, high, high commitment level. Yeah, because God does. Church on the Rock for our dream team who we have the best. Boy, the bar is getting raised high. Yeah, because God wants us to bring out the best in each and every one of us. Now, how do you do that? How do you do that? How do you bring out your best and give it to God? Let me give you four things right here. Four things that we, we bring out our best version of ourselves by using our background our background. Boy, I got to hustle. All of us have a different background. Don't let your background be a weight. Don't let your background be an excuse. Don't let your background be some baggage that holds you back from being your best. Use your background maximize your background. We all have different backgrounds. We all got skeletons. We've all got failures and mistakes and things we wish we hadn't have done, but we're learning, not losing from our background. So we're, we're to bring God our very best according to scripture, right church? And so to bring God our very best, how do we do that? We use our background. We don't use it as an excuse. Number two, we bring our best by our experiences. We all have different experiences that makes up your story, that makes up your testimony. So we're going to use our background. Number two, we're going to use our experiences. And number three, we're going to maximize and develop what we help you do this in growth track. 201, step two, is we're going to maximize our God-given gifts. Every one of us in this room and those of you are online campus, we all have been given gifts. And so every day we are to be developing and upping our skill set and getting better at what we do. So God says right here, let everyone, not, no, no one's left out, everyone. See, see, one of the greatest enemies for you and I being our best is complacency and mediocrity. Boy, when you get that raise, don't forget to tithe on what I just told you. That'll give you a raise. The greatest enemy to contentment is not only complacency, but it's mediocrity. The law of the most is average. The law of the most is average. Just like this Thanksgiving kit that our team worked on, they came in extra, no pay, and they put this together yesterday so you'd have it this weekend. So it'd be a fabulous Thanksgiving. What is that? Above average. Above average. So the, the law of the most is to be average. So what do we do? We use our background. And then what do we do? We use our experiences. And number three, we use our gifts and we get better at that. And then number four, we use our God-given opportunities. Wow. We use our God-given opportunities. Opportunities. So, so I interrupted you. Would you please forgive me? Here we go. Let's start at the very beginning. One, two, three. Wow, what a good word, right, church? One more. Second Corinthians, or First Corinthians, chapter four, verse seven and eight. Oh, this is amazing. I know I'm having you read, but you're just reading so good, and this is so powerful. And why am I having you read? Can I give you a secret? When you hear yourself say it, you tend to believe it better. 
psychologically proven. Okay? So here we go on the count of three. One, two, three. Everything we have and everything we are, our breath, our eyesight, hearing, walking, car, truck, job, career, kids, marriage, friends, everything we have, our gifts, our talent, our skill, everything we have and everything we are has come from God. It's a gift. So why are we comparing ourselves and competing? Folks, I'm not competing with anybody other church in town, and I'm not comparing our church to any other church in town, and neither should you. I, I, I'm not competing or comparing my family with any other family, and neither should you. I'm not competing or comparing myself as a minister to any other minister, and neither should you. Here's what I know. Michael Jordan, y'all know who Michael Jordan is, right? Years ago, his mother, who's born again, filled with the Spirit, loves God. We had her come and speak in our North Campus, Michael Jordan's mother. And here's what she said. She said, you know, the greats never really compete with other greats. The greats, when they get on the court, they never really are on the field or on the soccer field, football field, uh, surfers, skaters, uh, baseball players. They, the greats really never compete with other greats. They're always, Anise Williams told me this as well. They always said that we compete against our self. We compete against our self because we know we can do better. We have potential that's untapped. Isn't that good? So we shouldn't be competing with others or comparing ourselves to others. It will only rob us of our joy. Amen? So, so here's the keys. Number one was stop comparing as the team comes out. Stop comparing ourselves to other people. Right, church? Number two, uh, everybody say, I love my pastor. Start celebrating other people's blessings. <laughs> that, that'll build contentment. It, it, that positions me for opportunities. And, and, and when we hear, and I love this about you all, Church on the Rock, because you're that way. You see, if somebody in our church gets a nicer car than we have, we celebrate the blessing of the Lord. Somebody gets a better job. They get a bonus. Uh, they get increased. They pay off a credit card. Uh, their loved one gets born again. They receive a healing. You know what? We start celebrating. We stop comparing. And number two, we start celebrating the blessing, the favor, the increase on other people's lives. Somebody last uh, Saturday night, not last night, but a, a, a week ago in our church, they came to me afterwards. They said, Pastor, you won't see me for a couple of weeks for the holidays. I'm doing a bucket list thing. I, I'm taking my family to another nation, another country. I've always wanted to do it. A and he said, but Pastor, it really hurt me. I said, what hurt you? He said, it hurt me because when I began to share this with our relatives and our friends, they weren't excited. They didn't rejoice. Pastor, I could tell they were envious and jealous and and mad and negative that we were getting to go and they couldn't go. Wow, how do you build contentment is, boy, when you hear somebody uh, writing a book, writing a song, paying off a debt, getting a new car, a better job, uh, uh, when you hear the blessings of the Lord in their life, you and I celebrate over God's blessing in their life. Amen, church. And then number three, number three, number one I forgot was what? Stop. And number two is start. And number three is stop complaining. Stop complaining. If I complain, I remain. You study the life of Job, and he'll talk about all through the book of Job how through his complaining it brought bitterness, rage, anger through complaining. Boy, has there, I don't think there's ever been more complainers on the planet than right now.
So I stop comparing myself with other people. Number two, I start celebrating other people's blessings. And number three, what do I do? Stop. And then the last one is what? I start a gratitude journal. And we have those for you as a tool on the way out today because gratefulness produces joyfulness. Did it help anybody today? I'm out of time. Give the Lord a thank you for his word today, would you?